Okay, hi everyone. Sorry I can't see you. I'm used to giving talks in a room in front of people I can actually watch and catch your facial expressions and know if I'm if you're understanding what I'm saying. So I hope this goes well. It's my first webinar. Um, I should first explain I am an American citizen. I have been living in Asia since 1994. So my whole feeling is for Asia. Um, but I'm going to talk a lot about the United States. I was just saying to Davos, the United States is fascinating as a test case in unbridled capitalism. Um, so we have a lot to learn from it. And I think um, India actually, um, I don't wanna go into detail about India, I don't know nearly as much about it, but there are certainly, you will see some of the connections. Um, I think there's some of the logic is also taking place in India and it helps explain some of what's been happening in recent pandemics. So I wanna talk, give you a big picture first about, um, this whole situation about um, economics and well-being and pandemics. And then I'm going to talk a bit more um, about India specifically, especially in terms of jobs. I know a lot of you are concerned once the coronavirus fades into the background, what is our economy going to look like in the future? So I want to start with the big picture and then narrow down. Um, so yes, <laughs> sorry, I'm so not used to doing this. I'm an old fashioned person. <laughs> um, the logic of capitalism if we can use the logic and capitalism in the same sentence, uh, some of the things that capitalism assumes is that, are that the environment, for instance, the, has no value. Uh, forests, rivers, clean ocean are of no value. The only value to the environment is what we can extract and sell. So a standing forest is worthless. If you cut down the trees and sell them as wood, then the value of the wood uh, surpasses the value of your forest. If you set up an industry next to a river and you pollute that water, unless you count the loss in fishing, it's basically a net gain, even though the river is now polluted. Under the logic of capitalism, health becomes a commodity. Now we're so used to this, we're so used to this idea of health consumers that it may seem odd to say that's illogical. But if we step back for a moment, the idea that health is something you buy and sell on the marketplace, we accept that. If you step back for a moment, you'll realize, how can that be? That's crazy. Health is supposed to be a basic human right, and yet we treat it as a commodity. That problem becomes obviously clearer when they're in the, we are in the middle of a pandemic. So what is the highest goal in capitalism? You would, well, you think about what you would like the highest goal to be, but what is the highest goal actually? Profit, selfishness. I am doing well. I must outcompete others. If my business is more successful and puts other businesses out of business, then I am a successful person. I deserve to be called sir, madam, I am proud, I am doing well, I will get honored. So my job is to do well for myself and not worry about others. And that is what capitalism encourages. It's unbridled form. So is the focus in capitalism on jobs? We know we're very concerned about jobs right now. Lots, millions and millions, core, uh, lock, lock, core, core people are losing their jobs. There's certainly discussion about that. But is that actually the focus of capitalism? Is the focus of capitalism things like something we're enjoying right now, clean air, and about the rest of you, I have asthma. I have not used my medicine in over a week. Last time that happened was I was in the Netherlands. Here I am in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I can breathe. <laughs> Amazing. That's not thanks to capitalism. That's thanks to closing down the capitalist system. So clean air, clean water are not the focus of capitalism. Health. As I said, health is a commodity. It's not a basic right under capitalism. Education. Education, again, is something we buy and sell in the marketplace. If you have more money, you get a better education. If you have less money, you're out of luck. Basic needs, all of these things I would consider basic needs. Other basic needs, affordable housing, um, clothing, some safety, basic things that we need are not the focus of capitalism. If you're lucky, you buy them on the marketplace. If you're not lucky, you struggle and you may not survive. So the actual focus of capitalism, if it's not on the environment, it's not on people, what is the focus? It's on gross domestic product, GDP, at all costs. 
the only thing that matters is that number, having it go up. And you know, what is GDP? How is it calculated? I'm not going to go into detail, but GDP essentially is production. It's production no matter what you produce. So it can continue, uh, it includes good things, but it also it contains things that are bad for us. I'll go into that more. Um, one of the side results of that is we produce a lot of billionaires and a lot of inequality. So for those doing well in the system, and they're obviously the ones with the most power, it works well. We know the results for everyone else. So in terms of the pandemic, the result of the United States having a, an extreme form of mostly unbridled capitalism, it is no coincidence that the U.S. has to date the highest numbers in the coronavirus epidemic. We've already surpassed Italy in deaths. We are on a straight line going up. Um, eventually, it will come down. Well, by the time we come down, we don't know how many tens of thousands or maybe lock, lock people will have died. Um, if you've been following at all, <laughs> there's this really weird thing happening in the United States where I watch late night shows and at the end, the host says, all right, um, we need protective, personal protective equipment, PPE for our hospital workers. We need to feed children. Can you please donate? You as an individual, can you please donate so that health workers have masks and gowns and so that children who are not in school can eat? Okay, why is it not the federal government who is ensuring that our health workers are safe and that our children are fed? Why is this an act of charity? I am stunned every time I hear someone with a straight face saying, please give money, please donate. Yesterday I was reading people saying, please buy lots of stamps to keep our postal service in business because the federal government refuses to support our postal service. So you shrink government, you turn everything into an individual responsibility, and this is what happens. I may have this number wrong, but I was looking at treatment costs in the United States. We know that millions of people have no health insurance. Health insurance in the United States is tied to your work. Millions of people are losing jobs, so they are losing their health insurance. It can cost $75,000 to be treated for COVID-19. Most people cannot afford that. At the same time that this is all going on, and this is just unbelievable to me, the government in the United States is trying to end the Affordable Care Act. And it is reducing, it has reduced environmental protections. So it's saying everyone is focused on this pandemic. Let's, behind their backs or even in front of their faces, let's further destroy our environment and let's take away access to health care in the middle of a pandemic. And it's shocking in one sense, and another, it's simply the logic of unbridled capitalism. So the bailout in the United States is supposed to help small businesses. It's supposed to help individuals. But if you've watched any of this, it's incredibly difficult for the businesses or the individuals to get support. One woman was saying she's been calling the unemployment hotline 50, 5 zero, 50 times a day. All she gets is recorded message, all our lines are busy. A businessman went to the bank, he said, how do I get my bailout? The bank official said, the government has not yet given us the guidelines. So they say they're going to bail out small businesses, they say they're not going to let individuals starve, and yet where is the bailout money going? To huge corporations. At the same time, and this again is unbelievable, except it's the logic of capitalism, government itself and various individuals are making a lot of money instead of trying to save lives. So the business of ventilators and masks, people are hoarding, even the federal government is hoarding, and then they sell at the highest profit. So. Uh, this is an example, the worst possible way to address an epidemic. Um, this is not the rich country way or the developed country way to address an epidemic. If you look at other countries, they are not doing this. Uh, one of the best examples in the so-called developed world is New Zealand. Almost no deaths. 
because in New Zealand, they understand that health is important. In the United States, we understand that money is important. Um, I am in Bangladesh. Uh, I am a bit concerned. Bangladesh has been following in some ways the Indian example. Um, and certainly there is a lot of um, capitalist belief in the uh, idea that money is the most important thing. So a lot of talk about help bailing out the poor. We're not sure how much that's actually going to happen. Um, in country after country, you can see different results depending on what the government prioritizes. But my main point here is we think, we've been told there is no alternative. This, this unbridled capitalism, money is the most important thing. Your focus should be on GDP, not on people's health or on the environment. Uh, remove the word no. There is an alternative. There is an alternative that is being used in many countries and needs to be the priority in many more, which is what I've called an economics of well-being. It's similar to what Bhutan calls gross national happiness looking at what matters. So as countries try to, I don't like the term develop because develop is fairly meaningless and um, often simply means rich get richer, the poor are screwed and the environment is a complete disaster. As you move forward, how are we going to have a response to the pandemic? Our economies are crumbling. When we rebuild them, which model we rebuild them on. And that's why I talk so much about the United States, because the United States is one model we could follow, and we have been following. As I'm saying, there's another model, which is the model of the economics of well-being. Before this whole pandemic hit, I've been spending a lot of time working on climate crisis issues and thinking, how do we get people to take this crisis seriously? How do we get them to change their behavior? We dramatically need to reduce climate emissions. And guess what's happened? We knew we had to for climate. The numbers kept going up of emissions. Suddenly, they're going down. Not because of the climate, but because of a virus. But there's a lot to learn. So clearly, the current situation is not sustainable either. The, the economics of pure capitalism is not sustainable. We've been destroying the environment. We're destroying health. This pandemic will be followed by other pandemics. The environmental crises are getting worse. Climate crisis is getting a lot worse. So that path was not a good path. We can't maintain this path of everybody sit at home, obviously. Millions of workers out of work. Uh, this is not sustainable. What could it look like going into the future? What if our priority was not simply on GDP? So all of our countries, how do we measure progress? How do we know we're doing well? We look at GDP, we look at production, consumption, no matter of what. If instead we prioritized other things, I know this sounds crazy, but what if we prioritized the environment? If we acknowledge the environment is the basis for human life and other life on the planet, we cannot survive without a healthy environment. How can we not take that seriously? If we prioritize health, we finally are, every time we go into a situation like this, we remember, oh yeah, oh yeah, health is important. Easy to forget when you're healthy and not in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, very easy to remember right now. People having their basic needs met and, and happiness. So, you know, am I smiling all the time? Not that, but are there conditions which allow me to feel good, to have time for my family and myself, to have strong communities again, those are all important. How would we get there? We need strong partnership between governments. Sorry, somebody's drilling outside. It's amazed, it's actually quiet in Dhaka. It's never as quiet, now it's noisy again. Um, government and civil society partnership can happen. It happens in many countries where government and civil society together, rather than subsidizing the multinational corporations or the largest businesses would support small and medium enterprises and the individuals and actually have activities to control the multinational or the huge corporations. We can have strong social policies like we have in Scandinavia and Western Europe and Cuba and Costa Rica, various countries around the world, where you support healthcare and childcare and housing and food and jobs 
and those become important. And rather than go this long circle of let's increase GDP and hope that people become employed and hope that they can buy the health care, the child care, the housing, the food they need, address those directly without subsidizing that big middleman, the huge corporations, and this can be done. So I'm talking about things like valuing well-being, not production, especially not, as I said, when we talk about harmful production. So when we look at GDP, part of why GDP is so high in the United States is we have a big arms industry, not these arms. Uh, we sell a lot of weapons. Why do we have so much war in the world? You know, let's have a ceasefires during the pandemic and then you can go back to killing each other. Why is there so much war? Because the arms business is huge and countries like the United States, it's a big part of our economy. We can't afford to give that up under the current economic logic. Uh, tobacco, I know that the Indian government heavily subsidizes the tobacco industry and you know the results in terms of, of people's health and lovely things like mouth cancer. Um, we subsidize unhealthy food. We subsidize all of these things that are bad for us, that are destructive for the environment in order to create some mostly badly paid jobs, why do we think that makes sense? Government together with civil society could be promoting equality, not 100% equality, that's impossible, sounds lovely, makes no sense, um, but you can have a floor and a ceiling. So you say, what is the basic minimum standard of living we are willing to accept in our country? No one will live, live below that. Every country sets it for themselves, or every community. So this is what we consider the minimum necessary. Nobody's gonna freeze to death in the winter. Um, everybody's gonna have enough food. People have access to, to uh, the basic things they need. And a ceiling. Why do we have billionaires? Why do we have, you might, I don't know, multimillionaires? Where do you wanna set the ceiling? Different countries can decide, but you say, there is an amount of wealth that is obscene and unnecessary and no one should be that rich because resources are limited and it takes away from everyone else. So you can actually promote equality. Getting back to pandemics, you can promote pandemic response based not on profit, as we're doing in the United States, but based on preparedness. And bailing out when you know your economy is going to crash because people have to stay indoors, Rather than bailing out the corporations, we tried this in 2008 in the United States, total disaster, bailing out the people, not the corporations. While we're doing this, we can seek ways to live more in harmony with nature. Right now, as you all know, we're living with reduced mobility. It's upsetting. It's annoying. It's also quieter. The air is so much cleaner. I saw a picture in China of a, some arch, which was usually completely in smog. Now people can see it. There are children, I realized, children who had never experienced clean air, maybe even adults. This is the first time in their life they are experiencing clean air. Think about that for a minute. We accept that it's normal, that we will never see clean air. Now that we're enjoying it, can we keep it? Can we hold on to this? Um, Car crashes. One of the reasons we're concerned about this overload of hospitalizations of people with COVID-19 is we need space in the hospitals to deal with car crashes. That's normal. People are going to die in car crashes. They're going to be injured. We, we accept that. It's um, 40 to 50 million people a year are injured and around the world over a million. Ten, sorry, I'm really bad at this. One core injured. One core killed. Four or five core injured. That's normal, accept that. Right now it's gone way down. What if we could keep it way down? Um, as I mentioned, greenhouse gas emissions, we desperately needed to reduce them and we are succeeding. Not the way we planned, not the way we wanted, but we are doing it. Can we hold on to that? Can we plan, rather than falling into this in an incredibly uncomfortable way, can we plan ahead to live more simple lives where our focus is on people, on the planet and on a healthy future. So we take what is positive about what's going on. You know, there's a lot of things that are negative right now, but there are some benefits. Can we take those benefits and figure out how to hang on to those while we rebuild our economies? So this idea of, do we go back to normal? Normal. If I can just take a moment to talk about how weird that word normal is. Human beings have been on this planet for, a few lock years. 
okay? Two or three lock years, people on the planet. Um, agriculture started about, I think, 50,000 years ago. We managed to move from hunter-gatherer to agriculturalists without destroying the environment. Most of the environmental damage and certainly the climate emissions have been in the last 40 or 50 years. That's all. So this idea that constant economic growth as measured by GDP is normal is a tiny, tiny blip of time in human history. And in that tiny blip of time, we have damaged the environment and killed off more species than is imaginable. Species extinction is occurring in some species at rates 65,000 times the expected rate. We are in the middle of another, I think it's the sixth or seventh mass extinction. This is what we consider normal. Before the pandemic hit, uh, I was reading a lot about the climate crisis and it is terrifying. And one of the things mentioned was disease. Disease is going to increase. And we don't know what it's going to be, but we know it's going to be bad. We know the flooding, the fires, you know, the fires in Australia, remember that? It seems like 100 years ago, those horrible fires in Australia, the fires in California, Davos is in California, right? Fires in California, the, you know, the, all these horrible storms. All of that is part of the new normal. Is that the normal we want? The normal of those scenes in India of all of those people walking, walking back to their villages because they're migrant workers, they have no work. Knowing that, that desperate poverty we see every day around us, all of that is normal. The pollution, the, the children who have never experienced clean air. A professor asked me one day, he said, Tell my, teach my students to love the environment. And I thought, how do I teach students to love the environment when they've never experienced the environment? They've never experienced, some of them have never experienced a rural area, but they've certainly never experienced a natural rural area. How do I teach them to love something they've never experienced? All of that is part of the normal. Inequality, poverty, pollution, insecurity, fear, violence, war, all of that is normal. Is that what we want to return to? So when we talk about restructuring our economy, rebuilding, and we're going to have to, we really need to keep in mind what is it that we want to see at the end of this rebuilding? Do we want to go back to where we were in 2019? Can we go back to something better? So, the way that we look at things now, and you know, there's a sense to it, there's a logic to it, we look at opportunities to make money. And if you make money, you can hire people and people buy products and the economy moves and this is great. But when we focus on opportunities, what we're not focusing on is, among other things, human needs. So I can make money selling soft drinks. This is awesome. I can make a lot of money. Do people need soft drinks? No. Do soft drinks kill people? Yes. But that's where I can make my money. Is that what we want to go back to? So what if instead we started by identifying what are people's basic human needs? What are things that they actually need to have? So you think of things like, okay, food, real food, not just super, super processed stuff. Food without all these chemicals in it. Wow, that would be nice. Um, so what if we subsidize, and I know that in Kerala they're doing this. I got to visit a program in Kerala where they're subsidizing chemical-free, home-based agriculture so that people can eat fruits and vegetables grown locally without chemicals, a government project, government subsidizing. Why can't that happen more? What else do people need? Things like education. You've got the system where people make money tutoring children Children go to school and then they get tutored out of school. I've never understood this. this. I didn't experience this growing up in the States. I moved to Bangladesh. I don't get it. What's this tutoring all about? Why don't we accept that education is a basic need and government invests strongly in it and this would also create jobs? What about our public space? You go out and the footpaths are broken or littered with trash. Um, there is no infrastructure for cycling. I lived in Hanoi for four years when they had a cycling infrastructure, you could pay someone to park your bicycle, you paid someone to fix your bicycle, you paid someone to pump your tires. 
all sorts of people were making money based on the fact that most people were riding bicycles, which obviously do not pollute, do not take up much space, are an amazing form of transport. Um, if I'm not mistaken, India has a long history of using bicycles a lot. You go a bit in the past and I'm sure in some places still in the present. A lot of advantages over motorbikes. You don't have the fuel companies making a lot of money. You have basic um, people, the lower level of the of income, but they're, they're employed, they're gainfully employed, people moving around without polluting the air and with a lot less congestion. Um, import replacements. What if we looked at not how much can we produce, but what do we actually need and getting more into quality. So rather than buying six pairs of Chinese plastic sandals that each break after I've worn them for a week, what if we went back to people actually making shoes that fit your feet? Actual handcrafted shoes, hard to imagine. This used to exist. Um, there's various things where we could buy something made by hand. It would be more comfortable, uh, much higher quality, last a lot longer, be more beautiful, more comfortable. And because it's labor intensive, it would create a lot more jobs than the plastic sandal factory. So if we looked less at profits and more at jobs, less it wants and more it needs. Returning to the basics, it's also things like, rather than this um, economy of consumption and disposal, we have kind of mastered it in the United States, other countries are trying to follow suit. Um, I'm delighted in Bangladesh, I can get things fixed, it's so exciting. The United States would just throw everything away. We could, we already are better at this in, in the so-called developing world, the um, world of less consumption, but Moving even further away to, from this uh, consumption to repair, like I said, more things that are handcrafted. And rather than focus on how do I earn more money, if we had our basic, some of our basic needs met by government, we didn't have to buy our education, pay for our transport, um, pay for all of these things on a market value, work less and have more time. I'm sure Davis can understand this, the value of time. One of the reasons I left the United States, people do not have time there. We are so consumption oriented, people work so many hours and then they don't have time for their families, for their communities, for themselves. And one of the things I most love about Bangladesh is that time is much more available. And I fully understand the value of time, how beautiful a thing that is to, you can live a simpler life and have more time for everybody else. So if we, our decisions as we rebuild the economy, if we focused on reducing climate emissions, restoring the environment, we've damaged it so much, how do we start repairing it? Health, equality, well-being. So rather than trying to return to what is, what was normal for a few decades, which is nothing, it may be our whole lifespan, but it's nothing in the lifespan of people, instead we move to something better. So if we used this horrible pandemic as an opportunity to rethink what we value in life, what we want to value, yes, we need people to get jobs again, but they don't need to get the same jobs back. A lot of the jobs were lousy jobs and there were jobs that were hurting us. How can we move to employment in ways that are better for people and for the environment? So I think I'd like to pause there and see if there's questions. Did anyone post any questions? No, just one I, I didn't hear. Is there anyone uh, with any questions here? I have one. Oh, yeah. Okay, we have gone uh, one. Can you see that? Okay, happened with after democracy is not just on the day of voting to the government. Revenue is dependent. Uh, yeah, democracy. Uh, sorry, a little water here. Um, democracy, that's a, that's a fun one. There is indeed a belief that democracy is simply voting. Um, sorry, it was cut up. Let me just look at this again. Nope, I don't have to do that. Okay. Um, I find Bangladesh a surprisingly democratic country because 
working for civil society, for NGOs I co-founded, we have a lot of access to government. We are able to advocate, sometimes successfully, for policies that are better for health and the environment. And that access to government, the ability to influence their decisions, to me, is democracy. So if I go and vote for a politician who is in the hands of big corporations who funded their campaign and the politician does not act in my interests, the fact that I voted for him or her is meaningless. So I completely agree. Um, when we talk about democracy, we really need to question what that means. How do you get, I mean, it's a huge issue, but how do you get money out of politics? As long as the corporations buy the politicians. So I like to say in the United States, how did we eradicate corruption? We legalized it. So as a corporation, okay, that's a good question. Um, how do, you know, if it's legal to fund a politician's campaign, you still have all the corruption. It just, you've made it legal. It's the same thing. There's really no difference there between the United States and countries like India or Nigeria, where we talk about corruption more. Um, so as you as an individual, what can you do to support the, uh, and economics of well-being? One thing is, I'm sure a lot of you are more tech savvy than I am. We have to get our voices out there. Um, you know, there's so much discussion about where are we going? What's going to happen? How do we get the economy restarted? We need a lot of voices saying, while we do the restarting, or you know, maybe that's not the right word, but as we rebuild, as we rebuild rather than restart, as we rebuild the economy, which economy do we want to rebuild? And I've noticed that in this discussion of coronavirus and its effects on the economy, people are talking about two completely different economies. So one is the economy is measured by the stock market. Um, how much money do billionaires have? How, much, uh, how well are the stocks doing? How well are big corporations doing? We have to bail out the airlines industry. We have to bail out the cruise ships. Uh, we have to bail out failing banks, whatever. That's one economy. Another economy is this issue of jobs. And it's not the same thing. So to believe that the people who talk about the economy are worried about the unemployed, no, wrong. Not necessarily. It, um, you know, some of the people who say we have to, this is an economic disaster, some of them mean Yes, people who, who, you know, the people who make their living every single day selling things on the street or, you know, various people whose living is day to day. Other people are talking about these big corporations losing money. And we have to dis distinguish between those. So, yes, we need to find economic opportunities for all the people who've lost their jobs. They don't need to be the same place they were. So somebody had sent some examples. One of them was the aviation industry. And I remember reading somewhere the Indian government or the Indians are very concerned that the aviation industry in India is going to collapse. And I thought, yay! I mean, it's terrible. I shouldn't say yay, but we need to fly less because of the climate. So we go through coronavirus, we bail out the aviation industry, and then we say, how do we convince people to fly less? It's stupid. So if instead we said, you know, a lot of concern about chemicals in our food supply, let's use that as an opportunity. People are concerned about chemicals in the food supply and we need to generate a lot of jobs. Why don't we subsidize chemical-free agriculture? We, the main thing we can, most of us can do right now, most of us are not powerful politicians. I joke that I would love to be the czarina of the world and just make all the decisions and everything would be perfect. Um, uh -huh, not really. Uh, what we can do is make our voices heard and engage in discussion questioning this idea that where we were was good, and that's where we want to go back to, where we were before this latest pandemic hit. And it, it's always bothered me that people tend to be focused on a single issue, so they don't like to look at where issues intersect. And I've, I've had this problem basically all my working life, where I always look at different issues coming together, and I look for how do you achieve benefits across many fields. So to me, that makes sense. We don't have time to solve every single issue separately. While we solve one issue, we make one issue worse. So then we go back to solving that one, but then we make that one worse. And you know, where are we ever going to move forward? If we step back and say, what would we like our country to look like? Not where we can we make money, but how would we like our country to be? 
do we want people to be able to eat, to have some security in their jobs, to have a decent home? Um, kids, all kids, no matter the color of their skin or whatever situation they have, you know, their father's a lazy alcoholic, so what? All children should have a decent education, have a chance in life, if that's what we want for our country. This is the chance to put that forward because we have to rebuild the economy. So why would we go back and rebuild the mess we had originally, you know, a few years ago, why would we just rebuild that blindly and then say, okay, now that we've rebuilt it, let's try to solve all the other problems that rebuilding the economy has helped to make worse. So if you say, okay, we know we have to act on the climate crisis. India already is one of the countries greatly suffering from it. The water crisis, my goodness, you know, you remember that? <laughs> That was all over the news a few years ago, uh, a year or two ago. So how do we address things like the water crisis? There are ways of reducing the problem. Most water is going to, not to homes, it's mostly going to industry and agriculture. How do we reduce that problem? So as we rebuild the economy, how do we rebuild it in the right way? Having that discussion, talking to people about it, questioning, saying, why are we just going down the same path that was the wrong path? Why don't we use this as an opportunity? How do I see, I think another question came up, uh, here it is, Q&A. How do you define poverty line as an indicator of development? Does that serve as the basis and ceiling of development? Okay, poverty line. Being a youngster, there are so many things such as fashion, luxury life, traveling around the world, fame, which is a dream life for most of them. How do we modify our lives and sense of matters as a country and environment? Okay. Um, Um, right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a poverty line. Like I said, it's the floor and the ceiling. A lot of people want to address poverty without wanting to address uh, a ceiling on wealth. And we, that's not possible. I can't remember, something like six people, six individuals in the world have as much wealth as half of the population of the world. That is not sustainable. You cannot address poverty without addressing obscene wealth at the top. So like I said, poverty line, when I was in Bolivia, I was amazed at how nice of homes the poor had, and then I realized Bolivia has winters. If people did not have decent homes, they would freeze to death. So a decent home in Bolivia does not look like a decent home in Mumbai. So it has to be somewhat local. But you can define your poverty line. We know what people's basic needs are. Um, I don't like the terms a dollar a day, two dollars a day. Um, I, that's focused on money, which is, in a sense, meaningless. What we should look at is, do people have what they need? The more that governments provide basic services, the less money we need, and then people can spend less time working, but also use their money for whatever way they want to use it, a lot more freedom as opposed to just trying to, trying to survive. A system where people do have opportunities, so the educational system is much more even, um, no matter how much money you have, you get a decent education. So the only way to address the poverty line, as I keep saying, is also to address bringing down the wealth at the top. We have enough resources in the world for everyone to have a decent life if we shared those resources much more equally. It would also dramatically reduce the climate crisis because much of the emissions, it's not just rich countries, it's rich individuals, people with private jets, they are contributing way more than their share. The average Indian is contributing way less than their share. We have to reduce uh, wealth at the top and we can have a discussion. So, okay, people are going to go back to work. That's great. A lot of people's jobs did not pay enough for decent survival. Do we want that? So what kinds of jobs, what we can consider a decent life, we can have those discussions um, again and again. What are the basic needs? How do we get there? Um, this question about young people and we want our luxury and I totally get that. Um, one of my friends was saying, you know, if we think that a cruise ship is such a great thing, what are we trying to run away from that we are running onto this cruise ship? Or, you know, we're so eager to get up on a plane or go somewhere else. We want to buy all these things. What are we trying to buy our way out of? So I agree that just having your basic needs met is not going to make people happy. And there is, there may be an uh, innate desire for luxury, but I suspect most of the desire for luxury is based on advertising. Um, direct and indirect. So we watch movies, we see people with these glamorous lifestyles, we want to follow them. One way is controlling advertising. But if you ask people, when are you truly happy? I've asked my interns, and I get a lot of interns, including from India, and they, one will say from shopping. 
most of them say I'm happiest when I'm with my family or with my friends, when I'm, you know, out of the park and we're just sitting around chatting or, you know, over a holiday, over Eid and you know, you're uh, puja and you're with your friends and your community, like we can't be right now. Um, or, you know, on Zoom, I'm chatting with my friends on Zoom or on Facebook, blah, blah, blah. So for most of us, what's most important is our friends, our family, our community. So we can have happiness in those ways. And we need to remind people, we need to say, look, yeah, those luxury goods sound nice, but you know, it's pleasure. It's not happiness. Pleasure is momentary. Um, it can be very nice, but it doesn't lead to deep inner happiness. And any study on happiness, if you look at what really people truly value, it is meaningful connections with people. So again, we need to remind people of that. In countries like Venezuela, oh God, Venezuela. In countries like Venezuela, the dictatorship, drug trapping, et cetera, have destroyed the country so much that they now have no provision to face the present pandemic. What can they do to save their citizens and also be free from the political pandemic? Okay. Um, I am not a great expert on, on Venezuela, other than knowing that it is a favorite, um, it's like the, the boogie monster, the witch that the, um, the uh, ultra right like to wave at people to say socialism is a scary thing. Um, one of the problems Venezuela has is that it has oil. So all of the countries that have a lot of oil uh, have serious political problems and I don't know how to solve that. <laughs> um, if you are a leader of a country who tries to go down the right path, and, and do land reform and actually work for the good of the poor, you are likely to be vilified by the United States and other, some other world leaders, which makes it difficult. It's a huge political question. Um, uh, I don't know how to help the poor Venezuelans. Um, we could say, let's not be like them. Um, it's very difficult to be independent. And we talk about independence. India, of course, more is a dominant force. Destroy the independence of its neighboring countries, excuse me, but you know, Bhutan and Nepal and Bangladesh kind of live under the heavy hand of, of India. A lot of countries live under the heavy hand of the United States. Vietnam is under the heavy hand of China. Um, how do you gain more independence and not be as, as oppressive to others? Part of it, the way we're, we're moving you know, more internally, we're gonna have to reduce world trade. We can't for climate and for pandemics, we can't maintain the same level of trade. Um, we're gonna have to look a little bit more internally and in some ways that's gonna be good because there is so much dominance and inability to, to act on the behalf of your private citizens when you, for instance, in India, you're forced to export vegetables and import vegetables, it's stupid. Like just grow vegetables for yourself. What's this import and export of exactly the same product? Um, so hopefully as things become a bit more focused on I mean, I don't want to say completely closing your borders. I'm not an isolationist, but as we focus more on working about worrying about our, our country's well-being and limiting some of the unnecessary trade with other countries, hopefully the negative pressure on countries like Venezuela will decline. Oops, sorry, I read the next question. Okay, let me just. Uh, what is your opinion on relation of nationalism and capitalism? It is evident that nationalism is a surge in the United States and is on the same level in India also. Is nationalism a cover-up of dirty antics of capitalism? Fun question. Um, nationalism, I think, is also known as populism. Populism is a weird word to me. Like, oh, it sounds like what's popular. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of world leaders right now. You've got Trump, uh, Modi, Bolsonaro, uh, John, Boris Johnson. Others, I'm sure, I'm forgetting. Um, unfortunately, as things get difficult around the world, we've got probably too many people on the planet. We have caused so much environmental damage. We've released so many, um, so much climate emissions that are, like greenhouse gas emissions that are climate is a, you know, we're having more and more na uh, natural disasters. It's scary, it's a scary time. And in scary times, uh, we get really corrupt awful leaders who say things that make people feel better and act in ways that make their lives worse. Um, so definitely it's connected. Um, some people are saying, you know, Trump is just a natural result of the U.S. emphasis on, um, on capitalism, on subsidizing the wealthy, uh, on destroying the environment. So it's a natural 
progression. Um, we've destroyed our, we've been destroying our health services, our public health services in the United States, making them privatized for probably decades. So this is a natural outcome. So all of these countries where we have not taken the needs of the, pop, the majority population seriously, they do lead to, unfortunately, leaders who are even worse. And um, the capitalist system is connected to a lack of true democracy. You know, in the United States, Republicans don't want Democrats to vote. They don't want people to vote. So, you know, it's crazy. It sounds like something a, a so-called developing country would do, trying to keep people from voting. All of that, um, yeah, unfortunately, as times get worse, we're going to have more of that. So again, we as citizens need to be the positive voice saying this is not what we, how we want to live. We as Indians want everyone here to be welcome. We, we you know, different religions, different skin color, we're all worthwhile. Um, we need to be the voice of a positive, uh, a positive uh, popular voice. Uh, let's see. To ensure a holistic well-being, welfare policies are a must, indeed. A state like Kerala, which has a deficit budget, yet never give up welfare vision. How should we be balancing the concept of money-making and well-being? This is in the context that state needs money to serve the people. Um, absolutely. Thank you for bringing up Kerala. I didn't know what the politics are in India and how much do I get to say how wonderful Kerala is. I know Kerala also has problems. I've been there. Enjoyed it very much, but I know, um, you know. The deficit budget thing is is tricky. I don't. I can't really. I don't. Can't really speak to it in terms of India, but uh, that's what governments do. They run up deficits, and if you notice, the United States, our deficits are always higher when we have a Republican. So our deficits are not because we're helping the population, which is indeed what governments should be doing. It's because governments are bailing out corporations. Like I said, the only example I know because I've worked on tobacco control. I know the Indian government heavily subsidizes the tobacco industry. Um, it's hidden subsidies, so most people don't know about it. So the taxes, if you dramatically increase taxes on tobacco products in India, it would still be nothing against the subsidies that the tobacco industry receives. So the Indian government, like other governments, a lot of the government expenditures are not for the well-being of the population. They're for the well-being of humongous corporations with some very, very rich people involved. So if you could cut down on those subsidies or preferably eliminate them and instead focus your expenditure on the population, uh, you could have, you'd have less wealth in one sense, you'd less money maybe moving around, but you'd have better off people. There was an experiment in the Netherlands, a computer simulation where they looked at government trying to increase GDP versus government trying to make the environment better. And in the course of making the environment better, they had a lot more repair uh, and reuse as opposed to new, uh, new construct, uh, building new things, making new things. Um, if they had followed that track of focusing on uh, the environment, not only would pollution have come down unbelievably dramatically, like 90% across different um, chemical, different pollutants, um, GDP would not have gone up, but more people would have had jobs and there would have been a lot more equality. So yes, governments need money. They actually have money. They would have more money if they taxed the rich more. Um, and they'd have more money to spend on the public if they didn't subsidize wealthy corporations to the same degree. Is there another question? Why is another question coming in? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to keep a time piece. How, what, how are we doing on time, Davos? Uh, yeah, we have six more minutes for the session. Six more minutes. Yeah, so we can- Okay, let me just, can I just, let me get back to that question of what can I do as an individual? Um, one thing you can do, by the way, I've written a lot of uh, shorter guides to being an activist. I, when I was working on tobacco control, I knew what needed to be done, but I didn't know how to get it done. So I started exploring, learning more about advocacy and writing guides. My favorite one I wrote is about uh, research and media, um, doing quick and dirty research and accessing media on a low budget. Um, they're all available. If you go to the Health, I can, uh, Davis can share a link later, but maybe, but um, healthbridge.ca. If you go to the library and go to books, almost all of the books in our library I have written. So there's lots of examples of um, how to do advocacy. Um, we are, there's a lot of communication going on and social media is so huge. Uh, we can reach people, obviously less now face to face, but we can reach a lot of people over the media, social media. Um, we can try to get articles written in the newspapers. I don't know how easy that is. There's a lot of um, online newspapers now. Um, 
I need to actually go and do that tomorrow, start writing articles for online newspapers. We can make our voices heard and our voices need to be um, voices questioning where we want to go as we rebuild the economy. Do we want to go back to the same jobs, the same pollution, the same inequality, the same degraded environment, or do we want something, some, sorry, something better? Um, there's a part of the world that believes billionaires can end world poverty. <laughs> Sorry, you just a straight face. There's a part of the world that believes billionaires can end world poverty with some celebrities advocating for this publicly. How practical and realistic is this idea? Okay, fun question. I think you can tell by my burst of laughter. Um, what was it? Bernie Sanders said we shouldn't have billionaires, and one of the billionaires said, well, we shouldn't have Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, other billionaires, they think they are, you know, king of the world. They're so awesome. They've made so much money. Look at how wonderful they are. It makes me absolutely sick that anyone thinks that it's, it's ethical or legitimate or acceptable to have that much money. Uh, if you look at how they made their money, there's usually something very, very dirty involved. Um, poor people get thrown in prison for nothing, and extremely wealthy people can do whatever they like uh, and get away with it and get respect. Um, no, billionaires are not going to end poverty. They're too busy hogging so many of our resources um, that how can you end poverty when someone has so much? The way they become billionaires is often partly by underpaying their employees. Um, the logic of more for me, less for you is not going to end poverty. The logic of I refuse to pay taxes. So um, one of the billionaires, Buffett, mentioned that his secretary pays a higher percentage of her wages and profit in, in, in taxes than he does. So billionaires are, and they're, they're using their money, they, they publicize their foundations. So behind the scenes, they are spending a ton of money preventing social change. So they are lobbying, they're paying, uh, giving money to groups that fight against taxes on wealth, etc., etc. Sorry, I think it was another question. So no, uh, billionaires are certainly not the answer. They are the problem. Why does Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn lose election even when they come up with better ideas? How can the far right be tackled in the modern world? Um, I was reading something interesting yesterday, watching something interesting, saying Bernie Sanders, yes, he keeps losing for various uh, reasons. I was actually thinking, I, I, I don't know that somebody who attacks the very wealthy can win a presidential election in the United States because Wall Street has so much power. Um, he lost the election, but he has won in the sense of transforming America. So I've always been amazed. America is the only country in the wealthy country in the world that doesn't have uh, universal health care. It was not acceptable to talk about it. Obama made the first big step when he did the Affordable Care Act. You know, he was ripped into by, by the Republicans in power, but he managed to push that through. And that was transformational. And now we've moved way past that. And people now realize that you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. That's crazy. So this whole idea of health, uh, Medicare for all, universal health care is now a perfectly standard topic. And even socialism, as I've understood, is no longer such a dirty word in the United States. So, you know, it's one thing to lose, an, uh, to win an election. That would be nice. You know, it would have been really nice to have somebody much more progressive than, than Biden um, as our candidate against Trump. But you can also win in terms of your ideas coming forward. So that is where we as individuals also have power. How can we push our ideas so that people understand we can do much better than we've done? Let's just not just rebuild to what uh, the awful situation we had before this latest pandemic. Let's rebuild to something much better. Let's take inspiration from these progressive politicians who have shown us what could be. Um, so, they may not always win the votes and, and the system is rigged and, um, you know, there's, we don't have, there's, I don't know a country that has true democracy. Some are better than others. Um, oops, let's do what we can. Also, since you mentioned Bernie Sanders and funding political campaigns being legal in the USA, why do politicians drop out in the middle of the campaign? Couldn't that funds then could have actually helped the people in need? Um, Yeah. Should we keep going, Davos? I'm, I'm, uh, I have nowhere to go. I know, I know uh, you, you love to take questions, but... Uh, I'm, I'm happy to keep taking questions if people, are, you know, people want to stick around. I, it's a holiday today here, so even if it were, if, if the office were open, it would be closed. <laughs> um, yeah, next to for like... So, yeah, keep going. Um, 
yeah, so Bloomberg. When Michael Bloomberg entered the race, I mean, I, I met Michael Bloomberg. I, I have a strong personal dislike of Michael Bloomberg. He's done some great things in New York City, but on a personal level, I think he's a jerk. Um, and there was a question of why is he spending millions of dollars in a race he can't win? And it's like he thinks the only thing that can save the country is a billionaire. The only person who can be a, a president now is a, a billionaire or a so-called billionaire. We're not sure Trump ever had billions of dollars. Um, yeah, could the money not have been spent better? Sure. Um, why do they wait so long to drop out when they know they can't win? Uh, presumably, largely ego. I think part of the reason Bernie Sanders stayed in so long was, I like to believe, it was because that was his voice. The Bernie Sanders voice in America has been super important. So at one level, and I heard today he it has actually endorsed Biden, thank goodness. I hope all the Bernie supporters vote for Biden. But if, if you have access to millions of people, to their ears, if you can reach you know, many core people with your mess, your positive message, you got to do that as long as you can. So there is value in doing that. Um, the money shouldn't, I mean, we need charity because obviously, but charity should not be our priority. Our priority should be social justice. So the, I've heard that Bloomberg is going to spend a lot of money um, on things like hopefully vote for mail, um, restoring democracy in the United States, trying to make sure Trump doesn't get reelected. We need to fix the big system picture. So I said at the very beginning, I am just, you know, it just blows me away. And I, 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 one thing I would like to say to everyone, please, please be shocked. Please don't take things for granted. You know, please be shocked that it's shocking that clean air is a new thing that we've never experienced before. That's shocking. Um, please be shocked that we're surprised. Wow, look, there's fewer vehicle crashes. Huh, well, you know, we could actually maybe not kill so many people on our roads. We take so many things for granted. Um, we take dysfunctional democracy for granted. We, we accept so many things. We've got to stop accepting these things as normal. We can do better, but the ability to do better depends on our belief in something better. And people like Bernie Sanders or other progressive politicians, they may not win as many votes, but if they, if they get people excited about politics again, I think that's the one greatest thing about some of these horrible leaders we now have around the world is that they're getting People who had given up on politics, um, some people in the United States, okay, the blacks have always suffered, and now that the whites are suffering, now they're interested. Whatever it takes to get more people involved in politics, understanding that they need to raise their voice for something better, that's a positive thing. Um, and what needs to be fixed isn't charity. We don't need more, well, we do need more charity, but much more important than more charity is we need uh, more social justice. Sorry. Let's see. For what kind of livelihood should our schools and colleges be preparing the current and next generation for, considering that unemployment is starting, is staring at us? Okay, so what kinds of jobs? Yep. Okay, and the next question is, since you spoke of subsidies in the Indian tobacco industry, would you be able to elaborate enough that we know where we can get data to question this? Okay, subsidies for tobacco. Um, right, so, Fun question about what should kinds of jobs should our educational institutions be preparing us for. I was actually at a seminar on quality of education in India in Bhopal, of all places, um, a couple years ago. And I gave a talk about, I was actually, I was listening to other people speak and they were saying things like, well, you know, students are the products of our system and how do we prepare them for the workplace? And, you know, you always read about how the educational system is letting us down because um, students, when they graduate, are not prepared to go into their jobs. And my question is, is the focus of the educational system on preparing people for the workplace, or is it on preparing people to be global citizens? So one of the things I like to ask people is, is your primary goal to be a consumer, or is it to be a human being, a, a, a global citizen? Uh, so are you more worried about what you can buy, or more worried about what you can contribute? Is your thought, how do I make money for my company? Or is it, how do I contribute to a community we all want to live in and people all can prosper in? So if our educational system is only about turning out people who can work in the existing jobs, I would say it's failing. I am fortunate that I had a good education in the sense that I was taught to think. I was taught to be creative. I was taught to be analytical, to use logic. And when I got out, I was completely unprepared for jobs. I was a bit worried about that, but I, I 
I, I'm extremely grateful for the education I got. So you can do some preparation. You can do, I mean, there's vocational schools. You can do various things to prepare people for jobs. But we absolutely must prepare people for society and a society that is going through incredibly dramatic changes. People who can look at it and analyze it and say, okay, is this what we want? Do we want something better? How do I move to something better? Where do I find the information? How do I know that information is reliable? Like one of the most important things now is teaching people how to uh, analyze whether information is, is real or whether it is just a bunch of nonsense that people are circulating on Facebook. Um, so one of the biggest jobs we have is, is not, you know, how do I step into my, my formal job? My biggest job is how do I help reshape my country more in the direction we want it to go in? So I would say, um, you know, we can have technical training. Like I said, it would be great to have people, more skilled artisans, building things by hand, um, employing a lot more people, a much more aesthetic, beautiful environment, um, you know, handcrafted quality, those kinds of things taking precedence over mass produced crap that, that, that contributes to our climate emissions at the same time that we teach people how to think and analyze. Um, subsidies for tobacco. I don't know exactly if you try Googling it, but there's groups like, I think what you can go to is, um, 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 there's an organization in England, um, uh, CFK, uh, no, that's not that one. Sorry, I have to remember it. But there is an organization that works on tobacco control that has a really good resource, um, a lot of resources. And it was a talk I went to probably in India where somebody said the subsidies are absolutely enormous, um, ITC. Um, uh, Char, I'll probably remember the name in a minute. Otherwise, I'll send it to Davos. Maybe we can get back to you later. Oops, where's the other question? In India, by, albeit education being a basic right, majority of children are still undereducated or uneducated. Having a law is not a solution. Well, there's no intention of enforcing it. Very good point. Even after 70 years of independence, we're still trying to get children to school. The public health system is also for namesake only. Many states, like the most populous Uttar Pradesh, where did India go wrong? Um, yeah, so education and health. Um, I just read a book, um, Orange is the New Black. I didn't realize the TV series was based on a book. This woman describes being in prison in the U.S. for a year. And I was reading this thinking, I, I feel like I'm reading a book about India, um, about prisons in India. Uh, the food is inedible. Um, conditions are absolutely horrible. You can't go into the shower barefoot because the mold on the showers is so disgusting. You would get some awful skin fungal disease and there's no health system in the prison to treat you. That was the United States of America. Um, I said I was fortunate. Um, I got a really good education. I went to private school uh, starting in high school. Um, the public schools in our neighborhood were awful, really, really, really bad. Um, I know people who graduated from uh, high school, certainly, who were functionally illiterate. Um, where did India go wrong? By believing the capitalist model, that GDP is the most important thing, and that education and health don't matter, that education and health, it's fine to privatize them. Um, every opportunity is an opportunity to make money. Um, just on a positive note, I remember there was a battle in India. Uh, I think it was a biscuit manufacturer said, rather than giving Indian children in school a home-cooked meal, why don't we give them biscuits? Um, so then we can sell more of our biscuits. And people didn't take it lying down. Indian activists got really angry, and they said, no, uh, it's really important that our kids eat a decent meal. And they fought against the manufacturer. And I'm reading this from out of the country. I hope what I read is true. They won the battle, and kids were continuing to get home-cooked meals. The quality of education, obviously another matter. Our kids in school, obviously a lot of them are not. It is to me a simple question of priorities that unbelievably around the world, a lot of people believe that money is the most important thing. And I understand that money is important, obviously, and it buys us a lot of things, but the belief that money is more important than our children or our environment or our health you know, here's the results, they're right in front of us. So we have to reprioritize and to say, well, how do you afford it? How do you get the money to rebuild the educational system? Well, invest directly, stop wasting money. You know, every single country in the world probably, but to very various degrees, very varying degrees, uh, subsidizes big corporations. So the ones that do it more, the ones that say, 
that subsidize the multinational or the huge corporations and hope that they hire people and hope that those people can then afford to buy themselves education and health. Let's turn this into a privatized system where the rich will always do the best and the poor will suffer tremendously. You know, those countries don't do well. But if you look at social policies in, in Scandinavia and Western Europe, and there's always been outliers, Kerala was a famous outlier, positive outlier, Cuba, Costa Rica, um, in the past, China. China environmentally, obviously, complete disaster. But um, China, a lot of things are wrong with China, obviously. But one thing they did do was refuse to listen to the International Monetary Fund. They took no advice from the International Monetary Fund. They rejected all their advice. And that is how China became quite wealthy. The IMF admits that. Um, so standard, standard economic advice, the kind of advice the World Bank or the IMF gives, uh, following that, leads us into complete disaster. Um, when I was re-researching the book Beyond Apologies, I should put out a pitch for that. Uh, it's free on the web. You don't have to buy it. Um, I'm not a capitalist. <laughs> My book is free. Uh, you can go to instituteofwellbeingbd.org. Um, uh, again, Davos can share the, the, the link. Um, our website's got some problems, but yeah, you can download the book. Um, when I was doing the research, and I, I attack economists a lot, but there's a lot of economists who are economists of well-being. They, they understand and, and they're promoting this and the examples do exist and there are countries that follow it much more than others and, and they do better. If you measure better in terms of how well the people are doing, the state of their natural environment, they somehow manage to afford these things. Huh, funny that. A lot of the poverty is up here and it's in our priorities. So, you know, it's uh, Recently, the government had a plan here to do a huge celebration of the 100th anniversary, birth anniversary of the founder of the nation. Lots of money for that, no problem. You want to build an elevated expressway, unlimited budget. I reviewed a transport plan. The $2 billion option was the highest ranked option. They rejected that. They wanted instead the $6 billion option that ranked, I think, number six. Uh, why did you have an extra $4 billion to promote a worse option? And you say you have no money for health or education. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's corporate lobbying. Um, we have to, we can reduce the corporate lobbying. Um, and sorry, I'm still trying to remember the name of that. And, oh, Ash, Action on Smoking Your Health. Sorry, that's what it is. Action on Smoking Your Health UK, I think is where you could get information. Ash UK is where you could probably get information about subsidies for tobacco in India. They have a lot of publications. Um, if you can't find it there, I can try to try to look it up, but there's a lot of people with tobacco control and a few of them actually are savvy enough to notice the subsidies. Um, there's huge subsidies for sugar, there's huge subsidies for all kinds of things that are bad for us. Um, yeah, governments waste a ton of money on either unnecessary projects or stupid projects or damaging product projects. Um, and, and, and we're too accepting as populations. We, we believe that that's how it has to be. So the first independence is up here. If we uh, liberate our brains from a lot of the, the brainwashing that we're, we're, we endure, if you open the business page, I was in the India at one point, I remember opening, looking at the newspaper, the business page, and it was, oh my gosh, I wish I could remember. It was an article by somebody from a major bank, and it was just such disgusting trash that he was writing. It was so annoying. And I realized I should read the, the business page. That's where you, you see a lot of this direct propaganda. We can't leave the stuff that people are telling us because most of it, it is propaganda. It's not true. Sorry. Uh, certain economists, including experts from IMF, believe that the global economy would have a V-shaped recovery once the pandemic was over. Wouldn't that mean that the world would go back to mass production and harming the climate? What can governments do to keep a healthy balance between capitalism, nationalism, and sustaining the environment? Okay. Capitalism, nationalism, environment. And the next question, can you please briefly elaborate on how World Bank and IMF promoting unvital capitalism because in Indian NGOs are vying for their funds. Always Bretton Woods sisters. Anyways, Bretton Woods sisters. Okay. IMF World Bank. Okay. The two questions I'd say are really, um, oops, sorry. The two questions are related, I would say. So um, how do we sustain as going forward, you know, the V-shaped recovery, and are we just going to go back to the same capitalism, nationalism approach and try to inject a little bit of green into it so we can have, you know, sustainable, sustainable development, which is a oxymoron, by the way. Um, the IMF, um, 
obviously is 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 going to make recommendations. It's um, I think they said fifty countries have approached them for assistance, which is tragic. One of the big things in Latin America was when countries managed to liberate themselves from the IMF. Um, unfortunately, yeah, there's going to be a lot of um, bankrupt governments as well as individuals. Um, so. First thing, um, okay, yeah, so the thing about IMF and World Bank giving in money to, to um, NGOs, fascinating. If you look at how much money they give to NGOs, it's tiny. I've seen, I, I, we've been in it ourselves. I do work for Canadian NGO. We applied for funds, and it's something like $10,000 we're applying for. I'm like, oh, this is so ridiculous. They're giving you $10,000 to shut you up. So I did once do a project for the Asian Development Bank, and I didn't want to take it, um, but it was about pedestrian facilities, but research on pedestrian facilities. And I realized um, I care about walking. And if somebody else does it, who doesn't care about walking, they're going to do a crappy job. So I decided I will take the money and I will say even more bad things about IMF than before, because I don't want to believe that they are silencing me. Um, unfortunately, IMF and World Bank, they give money to NGOs, to civil society in order to silence them. As corporations do the same thing. So-called um, CSR, corporate social responsibility. It's a way of, um, improving your image and shutting up the people who would complain about you. Um, um, in the United States, Playboy. Um, hope you can hear me through the uh, Azan. Playboy, through its uh, foundation, they give money to things like rape crisis centers because they don't want rape crisis centers to speak out against pornography. Can you hear through the Azan? Yeah, okay. It'll only be a couple minutes. So, um, yeah, that's the whole thing of, of no, we do not go back to so called business as normal. The level of climate emissions in the 1950s was dramatically lower than it is now. The 1950s, the world was modern. We were already a modern world. Why can't we go back? I'm not saying the 1950s were an idyllic time. There was no time that was idyllic. But why do we think that, you know, we jump on airplanes to travel around the world so easily. We have so much international trade. Even things we grow are locally, we produce locally. We send it somewhere else and then import the same thing back. This whole system we've developed in the last few decades, it's normal. Only in that tiny blip of time, we, we, we don't want to go back to that. We need to be clear that we do not want to go back to that. We need to be clear that IMF, World Bank, they are not about, they say they want to eliminate poverty, bullshit. They, they, they're about um, subsidizing giant corporations. They are heavily influenced by the United States. Um, they fund things like pipelines so they can get more petrol to, to businesses, to, to huge industry. Um, you know, they, they've engaged in so much villainous behavior. They were part of when Russia, when the um, Soviet Union broke up, how did we get all these Russian oligarchs? IMF was largely behind this destruction of Russia and turning it into this, you know, um, capitalist dystopia. So yeah, people before in lines to get goods. Now there's no lines. There's uh, fancy stuff in the stores and almost nobody can afford it. You have all these billionaires. There is nothing resembling democracy in Russia. IMF was part of that. IMF um, helped destroy Argentina. Um, huge economic crisis. If you do do some research and look at countries that have moved away from getting loans from IMF, there's more regional cooperation. Venezuela was actually part of that. And I do not know, and this sounds like conspiracy theory, but um, um, you know, why did the US destroy Libya? One of the theories is the US decided it had to take Libya down because Libya was trying to create an African alliance. Africa's got gold, it's got cobalt, it's got um, diamonds, you know, it has a ton of wealth. One of the poorest countries in the world is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is also one of the wealthiest in terms of its natural resources. If African countries banded together uh, and, and competed, you know, did not accept money from IMF or World Bank, if they worked together and did not allow Europe and the United States to dominate them, they could be a major force in the world and the US wasn't going to tolerate that. So Libya was trying to ban them, bring them together and that was destroyed. Who knows? Uh, a possibility. Um, so we don't want to take IMF's recipes. We don't want to take the World Bank's recipes. Um, they're recipes for disaster. Uh, there's lots of information about that. There's people who used to work for World Bank who have written books about what a disaster the World Bank is. You know, we, we uh, again, all this stuff is in um, Beyond Apologies, but there's lots of information out there. We need to educate ourselves and keep asking that question of, are we really okay with how things were? I've been to India many, many, many times, and I, I, I love the food, I love the clothes, the people are awesome, um, the in physical environment is 
if in the city certainly is atrocious, um, the poverty is appalling. Um, there's so much potential. If you rearrange your priorities, if you said it's people in the environment that matter and we're gonna reorient our system, super hard because you've got so many people, but it's gonna be harder if you go back to supporting billionaires and giant corporations. So please be part of the, the voice for positive change. It's been a pleasure, thanks. <laughs>